Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining Maine Conservation Voters Lunch and Learn on Maine's Climate Council. We're really excited about today's amazing lineup of speakers. My name is Maureen Druin, and I am Executive Director of Maine Conservation Voters, which makes the protection of our environment a political priority by electing candidates to public office, by passing policies that protect our air, land, and water, by working in collaboration, and by ensuring accountability of our elected officials, regardless of political party. Our program should last about 50 minutes today. A few technical notes before we begin. First, this event is being recorded. Um, second, Will Sedlak and Abigail Bradford from our team are here to make sure everything is running smoothly. So if you're having technical difficulties, you should chat with Will Sedlak. You take your uh, mouse and go to the bottom and there's a little chat box and you can write a message directly to Will and he'll take care of you. Um, you are all muted, but we do wanna hear from you. Please send your questions and comments to Abby, to Abigail Bradford, also at the bottom using the chat function. You can hover your mouse down there over the screen and the chat box should, should come up. Um, Abby will keep track of your questions and I will ask those questions to our presenters at the end af after they uh, are finished presenting. Um, finally, we'll all send you a link of the recording of this later this afternoon. And you can find all of our Lunch and Learn recordings as well as a schedule of upcoming events on our website at mainconservation.org. We are absolutely thrilled to be joined by Hannah Pingree, who is the Director of the Governor's Office of Policy Innovation in the Future, by Commissioner Jerry Reed of the Maine Department of Environmental Protection, and Dan Burgess, who is the Director of the Governor's Energy Office. Our speakers will give an update on the Climate Council's work to develop a new climate action plan for Maine that ensures a reduction in carbon of 45% by 2030 and 80% by 2050, aids in community resilience, and builds a clean energy economy for all Maine people. Um, now, I and two of my colleagues, Kathleen Neal and Beth Ahern, who are also on this Zoom call, are serving on three of the working groups of the Climate Council, and I see a few others who are on this call who are also serving on working groups. Um, and as we were prepping for today, our speaker said, well, you know, why don't you talk about what it's like um, to be part of this working group and how it's going? So I just wanted to share a few things. Um, now, for me, it's been really exciting to be part of a team that's working on solutions. And this especially given the, the last several years of inaction, it's, it's really fun to roll up your sleeves and get to work. Um, I've been very impressed by the level of expertise and skills and professionalism of the other folks on the working groups. Um, and as you can imagine, it, there's a diversity of perspectives and constituencies, and it's not always easy um, to agree on the solutions. Um, but what I found is that even though um, there is some you know, figuring it out. We're all really committed to the state meeting its climate reduction, its um, carbon reduction goals um, and the other goals laid out in the legislation. Um, I'm really excited. We're getting down to the final recommendations. I'm really excited I, on the Natural and Working Lands Group where things are headed and the recommendations that will be going to the Climate Council in June. I know that Kathleen and Beth are also excited about their working groups. Um, and just overall, I want to express how grateful we are for the leadership of the Mills administration. Um, even in the middle of this COVID-19 crisis, this pandemic, the governor has continued to make, and she has said that working on climate change continues to be a high priority for her administration. And we're just so grateful for that. Um, and as I turn it over to Director Pingree, I just want to thank her and Commissioner Reed and Director Burgess um, for your commitment to realizing the governor's vision. I know there's so much um, that you're doing to make this a reality. So thank you. Um, thanks for being here today and I'll turn it over to Hannah. Great, well, it is, um, it's wonderful to be here virtually with you all. Um, hopefully everybody is, get some chance to enjoy what looks like a super sunny and beautiful day out there in Maine. Um, Jerry and Dan and I, as well as many members of the Climate um, Council and working groups have spent a lot of our lives on Zoom. So we're, I think the, the chance to live in a beautiful state like Maine uh, allows us to balance both. 
Um, I'll just say last month alone, the uh, six council working groups, the science committee um, had 30 working group meetings in 30 days in the month of April. So, um, you know, bragging about meetings is not necessarily a sign of progress, but I just, it really does show uh, even in a challenging time and a, a very uncertain time, uh, the governor is um, focused on climate, our team and our working groups and uh, 231 people in Maine who are part of our official process um, continue to dig in despite all that's happening. So um, I'm really proud of that work and really more grateful. Um, Marie, Maureen, to you and your team who's, who's um, really been supporters from the very beginning and you know, to the hundreds of Maine people who are engaged in our process and putting in time and effort, um, even, even during this challenging time. So just again, thank you. Um, just go to the next slide. I'm sure we'll get there. Good. Um, so just, just from clearly from day one, Governor Mills made one of her top two um, issues, climate change. I mean, she it was the first thing she talked about in her inaugural address the need for our state to start to really put action plans in state place and start taking action on climate. Um, she has made it a priority throughout her administration and we really now a year and a half in, um, we're gonna talk today about some of the progress we've made um, and the work of the council, um, but already a lot has been accomplished. Um, I will say that this COVID crisis um, is taking up a lot of the governor's time and certainly her administration's time um, but again, we have not um, slowed down our focus on creating a four-year climate action plan for Maine. Um, again, we have moved all of our work to Zoom and to virtual meetings, still publicly accessible, um, but the work has not slowed down. We are, we are still on track. Um, Jerry will go through some of the timeline issues of, of where we are and when we're going to be done. Um, but again, it has not slowed our progress. Um, I just think this this COVID crisis is sort of um, has certainly changed the way we think about crises and how how kind of people can come together around major challenges that our country faces. Um, clearly, we're not necessarily seeing that in Washington, but I think it's been um, important for people who are part of this process to realize like there is still this crisis out there, and and I my commitment to focusing on it remains just as important. Um, certainly, I think this crisis has heightened our appreciation for nature, living in a state like Maine, um, our ability to interact uh, in such a beautiful state and appreciate what we have and understand some of the challenges that climate change could pose to our, to our nature and to our outdoors um, is, is heightened. Um, and I also think this crisis, at least uh, for now, people really are believing in scientists, at least I am. I mean, I think we are looking to doctors and to experts um, and that is where we are trying to focus our, our climate work as well. I mean, I know that many folks in this call have always believed in science um, and being able to elevate that science is clearly important in both crises. crises. Um, and clearly this COVID crisis is also challenging our communities, our economic systems, our systems of resiliency. Um, and that is really what a lot of our climate work is about. How do we make sure that our communities, our landscape, um, our energy systems are able to withstand um, the kinds of challenges that um, climate change will bring. So there are a lot of um, there are a lot of similarities between the crisis we're facing um, and the current COVID um, epidemic. But I think um, and and we're trying to sort of carefully tread on those. But uh, again, the governor's uh, focus on this issue remains um, really at the top of her agenda. And again, you won't probably hear her talking about it in the next couple of weeks over her press conferences, but she knows the work we're doing and the work of all of our working groups is happening and is, is really pleased with that. Um, so again, it's great to be here. Um, Jerry, Dan, and I are gonna try to take you through some slides that just explain the Maine Climate Council, uh, the work that we're doing, the energy working group, um, which is among our most important. Um, but again, so thank you. And I'm gonna just pass it quickly uh, to Jerry to, to kick it off as well. Thanks, Anna. Yeah, and thanks to Maureen and, and Beth and Kathleen and the whole crew. Um, I'll just uh, add a couple of thoughts to what Hannah had to say. I think, as Hannah alluded to, the COVID-19 crisis has handed us a lot of challenges in different forms, some of them logistical, as Hannah was saying, as we're shifting the, the mode of presentations from what we thought were going to be a lot of really good, exciting in-person meetings 
with the council and the working groups to these these virtual Zoom meetings and other other virtual get-togethers like the one we're doing today. But there's another challenge that we've been talking about internally, and that's how to message appropriately in light of the public health crisis. And we've seen a lot of stories, I think, in the in the popular media recently. It seems like there's an irresistible urge to focus on some of these short-term environmental dividends, you might call them, um, that the pandemic has brought along with it. And, and most of those are in the form of reduced emissions and improved air quality. But we think it's really important not to dwell on those or really give them undue emphasis for a few reasons. One, obviously, they're, they're inherently short-term, right? And, and uh, the best um, thinkers who have taken a look at this have concluded that what we can expect is that when the pandemic does ease, God willing, there's gonna be a huge push to rev the economy back up both here and globally in ways that will more than compensate for whatever short-term emissions reductions we saw while the, pandem while the pandemic was kind of in full bloom. So there's nothing long-term about it. Um, but you know, beyond that, I think we've gotta be really careful. And I think people on this call are not the ones that we would be concerned with because you're very tuned into these issues, but some people who are probably more casual about how they deal with these issues might be tempted to point to those short-term environmental uh, benefits in ways that almost sound like they're being celebrated. And I think the critics and cynics of, of climate change are just waiting to pounce on that. Anything that sounds in any way like people, environmentalists writ large, are, are taking any satisfaction in, in the uh, pandemic would be, you know, it's, it's just toxic. And, and there's just way too much human suffering and, and economic dislocation to allow any of that to creep into our messaging. So we're, we're trying to be very conscious of that. Having said that, I do think there are some really valuable lessons to be learned from how society has quickly adjusted um, to deal with the pandemic in terms of teleworking, and we've seen that in state government, telemedicine, the need to expand broadband. It's really pointed up where broadband, um, uh, where the uh, shortfalls are that need to be addressed. And so, so, you know, while not celebrating any kind of silver linings, I do think it's, it's really helpful to focus on the lessons that we have learned and try to take those, grab them and apply them in the climate change work that we're all committed to as the pandemic urge uh, eases. We, we've, we've seen that these things can work. We've had um, more than a, you know, a trial run. Society has really adjusted very well to, to this in a lot of ways. And there are long-term climate change benefits that we can, we, can, uh, we can realize as a result of what we've learned. Um, the other thing is, I'll just quickly mention, you know, to say that the uh, federal administration has been a disappointment on environmental matters is obviously a gross understatement. Um, and as long as this administration remains in, in, in place, it's going to be incumbent on the states to take the lead on issues like climate change. So that really underscores the importance of the work of the council and uh, the Mills administration is very committed to being a leader in this area. We'll do it on our own, but I think we can also do well by teaming up with like-minded states to try to um, take advantage of the synergies that are available uh, by building coalitions that way. So those are just a couple of opening thoughts I wanted to share before we uh, turn to the next slide. Great. Thank you, Jerry. All right, next slide. Excellent. Um, and, I, and as Jerry just said, we won't go into it, but clearly the, the administration in Washington is making some climate issues worse by the day. So uh, our work is certainly cut out for us. Um, we put we put up this slide about um, because I think it does just to highlight the governor's leadership. I think as many people know, she was invited to the United Nations this past September. She was the only uh, uh, governor to speak um, before the UN General Assembly. She um, signed the executive order, which um, uh, requires the state to be to achieve carbon neutrality by 2045. Um, it was it was incredibly exciting, and again, just highlights um, both the governor and the states. 
um, leadership and climate, which has really been something that um, I think Dan and I will both talk about sort of the actions that have already happened in the past year. Um, next slide. So just a couple of the, the highlights, Jerry talked about working with other states. Uh, one of the first things the governor did was join the United States Climate Alliance. Um, they have a great website. If you don't know about them, um, please go to see. It's an alliance of now um, 25 US states committed to meeting the Paris Climate Goals. Um, the US Climate Alliance was started by um, New York, um, California, and Washington State um, the day after Trump with, um, announced intention to withdraw the US from, from Paris. Um, we are among uh, the, I think, third or fourth largest economy in the world, just those 25 states, and we represent the majority of the US population. Um, we have made this, those 25 states um, steady progress on reducing emissions while our economies have grown faster than the other 25 states. So I think uh, the, the Climate Alliance has really demonstrated that without um, federal leadership, um, the states will continue to take action. Um, just a couple of the other things I'll quickly mention in the governor's first couple months of office, uh, she helped launch um, the VW um, rebate program to help us start with electrification work. Um, that money has been incredibly helpful to do some of the key um, starts of that. Jerry was a, an attorney general under the governor who helped us as a state um, secure those VW settlement funds. And, and now, obviously, as a commissioner, he's helping us to oversee it. Um, the governor signed legislation to restore net metering. Um, Dan will talk a little bit more about the, the extensive work the state has done to encourage the solar industry and renewable energy in Maine. Uh, she ended the blanket ban on wind power in Maine that had been enacted by the LePage administration. Um, and maybe obviously she withdrew Maine from the offshore drilling coalition. Uh, next slide. So I'm gonna kick it over to Dan because I think we had a really exciting, uh, especially 2019, um, probably one of the most tremendous and exciting environmental legislative sessions uh, the state had seen in many, many years. Um, a ton of stuff was accomplished that really builds the groundwork for the Climate Council's work. Um, I think the governor felt while she's, she was going to start the Climate Council to make a four-year action plan, she was not gonna wait for that plan to get going. And Dan has really helped to take the lead on, on the, the things that he'll talk about now. Thanks, Anna, and thanks to you all for um, again, having having me uh, join this, it, you know, it's a, it is exciting to think about all the work that that um, went into legislation being passed last year on, on these categories, and we've really um, moved to the implementation phase, and so we're starting to see the results from this. So, um, as many of you may know, um, Maine now has a renewable portfolio standard that is uh, required to be 80% by 2030. So 80% of the electricity that uh, Maine people receive in 2030 will come from renewable resources. That is one of the most ambitious uh, increases in the country. Uh, we are you know, a, a smaller state, only 10% of the New England electric load, but the pace at which uh, we are gonna be increasing our renewable energy is, is, is significant. Um, and we've also set up a, a goal of 100% renewable power by 2050. Those, those requirements are, are in law and in statute, and we're beginning to see um, the implementation of those programs now. Uh, one way in which that's happening is through uh, Maine's largest uh, clean energy procurement in history. Uh, bids are actually due to that, to the PUC this Monday, and then, then they'll be beginning to uh, review those bids and sign up for 20-year long-term contracts. So really significant movement in, in the larger uh, utility scale renewable portfolio standard projects. Uh, in addition to the restoring net metering, uh, the governor signed uh, LD 1711, uh, supported by uh, many of you and organizations on, on this call, which uh, is gonna incentivize at least 375 megawatts of solar. Um, currently Maine right now has roughly 60 megawatts of solar, and this legislation will um, uh, add a, at at least 375 and more likely to the 400, 500 megawatts of solar. So really significant uh, opportunities for increased solar and is, and is uh, looking at and uh, will be incentivizing community shared solar, solar that um, uh, benefits low and moderate income individuals in our state 
and we're seeing just incredible interest uh, across the state as that rolls out this summer. And then Maine is actually the most uh, heating oil dependent state in the country. Over 60% of our homes utilize home heating oil. And so the governor set a very ambitious uh, goal of installing 100,000 new high efficiency air source heat pumps in Maine by 2025 with a focus on low and moderate uh, income residents with just about 550,000 households uh, adding 100,000 new heat pumps uh, is a really significant uh, step and uh, rebates and incentives are now available uh, at Efficiency Main Trust to, to uh, make, that, uh, make that a reality. So uh, we have a significant legislation passed last session and now we're beginning to implement a lot of those, those programs and policies. Okay, next slide, please. So this slide shows um, the statutory greenhouse gas reduction goals that are set forth in the statute that the governor signed in 2019 that created the Climate Council. We have a 45% reduction goal by 2030 and 80% reduction goal by 2050. It's important to note that those are uh, gross uh, greenhouse gas emission reductions we're talking about, not net. So they're far more ambitious. As a result, um, we're working from a 1990 baseline, as we'll see in some of the upcoming slides. All the goals in the pre-existing statute are also measured against that 1990 baseline. You also see here some of the themes that are set forth in that statute. The council is directed to rely on the latest scientific and technological information and to analyze the technical uh, feasibility and cost effectiveness of the solutions that are under consideration. The foundation of what we're doing is to try to build a clean energy economy and to tap into the opportunities for job creation that'll come along with that. And I think one of the really important themes that runs throughout the statute is that we are to consider the impacts on main people and communities in everything that we do. So this isn't a dry academic or abstract exercise at all. It's something that is going to be and must be really closely tailored to meet the unique needs of Maine people and to take into account the uh, unique assets that we have as a state, both in terms of the natural resources and coastal economy that we have, and also to take into account the unique vulnerabilities that we have as well. So it's a very specific Maine-based approach to the exercise that we're, we're undertaking. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is an important and interesting um, graph that we could spend a lot of time talking about, but it shows both the recent history of greenhouse gas emissions in the state of Maine. That's the dark blue line that looks kind of like a mountain peak to the left of the graph as well as um, a downward sloping uh, line, which indicates uh, what we will need to do in order to meet the statutory goals I just mentioned. So a couple things to note here, greenhouse gas emissions in Maine peaked in, uh, in 2005 and then started going sharply downward until about 2012, um, where there was a slight uptick in emissions again and they've now resumed uh, the downward trend more recently. I'll, I'll mention here that DEP issues a biennial greenhouse gas emission um, report that analyzes in some detail uh, what uh, the inventory is of greenhouse gas emission emissions in the state of Maine and what the uh, source of those emissions is so if if for, for the nerds out there among you and i say that affectionately if you're looking to burnish your nerd credentials you can find a copy of that report um, at the dep website um, click on air and then go down the the uh, menu to click on reports and you'll find that and and you can um, roll around that for quite some time and find it quite interesting um, a, a few things to note you'll see where the, the blue line drops off is about uh, is in 2017, and at that point, it's not you don't see that on this graph, but we're at 17.5% below 1990, uh, the 1990 baseline as of 2017, which is the most recent year we have um, 
uh, data to analyze available. Um, so you can see that we didn't have any trouble meeting the pre-existing statutory goal of uh, in 2010 being below the 1990 baseline and we're well on track to uh, meet the 2020 goal of being 10 percent below 1990. So um, I'm optimistic that on my watch as commissioner I will never fail to attain one of these statutory greenhouse gas em emission reduction goals. Um, Dan can probably talk a little bit more about this uh, when we get to his portion of, of the program, but um, you're probably wondering what accounts for some of the uh, pre-existing um, greenhouse gas emission reductions in the state. And I think some of that is attributable to the transition to natural gas. Some of it is probably attributable to um, economic factors, including mill closures. So we're not gonna be able to count on either of those two things in the future to meet the ambitious goals that we have flying ahead of us. Um, there are other regulatory programs that I think deserve some credit. The Reggie program, um, improved vehicle emission uh, standards, um, other energy efficiency and conservation programs also are responsible for having reduced emissions to some point. But I think the important message is that uh, we're going to have to take this to the next level um, in order to meet the goals that we have ahead of us. And that's going to require some um, creativity and uh, some tough decisions that we'll talk about a little bit later in the, in the upcoming slides. Next slide, please. So this uh, pie chart reflects the um, greenhouse gas emissions in the state of Maine by sector. And what's important about this is that Maine is quite unique in how large the transportation sector is and its, its responsibility for its share of emissions. It's also true that, as Dan said, as, as the most heavily reliant state on home heating oil in the nation, the residential sector has a disproportionate responsibility for greenhouse gas emissions in, in the state of Maine. So this profile is, is quite unique and very different from other states that, for example, are more industrialized, generate um, elect more electricity um, in state um, through fossil fuel burning, for example, um, and don't have such a large land mass that's so sparsely populated, which is one of the driving factors behind the large share of the transportation sector for, for the emissions that we see here. So it, it points up kind of where we need to turn as the Climate Council to find the emission reductions we need to make to meet our goals. Next slide, please. So this uh, slide just shows the basic timeline between the governor's signing of the bill that created the Climate Council in June of 2019 in September, the governor, by September, the governor appointed all the 37 members of the Maine Climate Council. And I think Hannah's gonna talk a little bit more about the makeup of the council and the working groups. So in September, we really launched our work in earnest. Um, we had a wonderful uh, meeting um, in Hallwell with a featured speaker, Gina McCarthy, gave a rousing speech as she does um, to get us all roughed up and started. Um, at that point, I will say, I think that the working groups as they were being pulled together, uh, were looking uh, out kind of tentatively about the, um, all the work that they had ahead of them and wondering how they were gonna possibly accomplish that. And a few months later, where we are now, I'm happy to report that a huge amount of work has been done as Maureen was, was indicating at the outset. And we feel really good about where we are at this point. Um, so we're, we're almost to June of 2020, as you can see here, where we're going to be holding the next Climate Council meeting over two days um, in a Zoom platform, two half days, so that none of us has to endure eight hours in front of Zoom in a single day. Um, and at that point, the working groups will start the process of presenting their draft recommendations to the Climate Council for its consideration. During the period of June through December of 
this year, the Climate Council will continue to consider and deliberate on those draft strategies and recommendations in order to finalize a revised climate action plan for the state, which we need to complete by, by December of this year. Next slide, please. So this uh, slide just shows kind of the uh, framework of the Climate Council and how it's created. I mentioned the, the council itself consists of 37 people um, chosen quite consciously to represent every conceivable perspective on the issue of climate change. It's not an echo chamber by any means. If it were, it wouldn't serve any purpose. Um, and underneath that structurally, as we've set it up, is the scientific and technical subcommittee headed up by Bob Marvini, the head of the Maine Geological Survey, and Professor Ivan Fernandez of the University of Maine, two wonderful people. And the, the placement of the subcommittee here emphasizes the point of the importance of, of science and data and evidence in the Climate Council process. The subcommittee both advises the, the council itself, but also is a resource available to the six working groups that you see identified below it, who can draw on the expertise of, of the subcommittee in the course of their work. Those, um, those working groups you can see address issues of buildings, infrastructure, and housing, coastal and marine, community, resilience planning, public health, and emergency management. Um, it seems like a bit of a catch-all uh, working group, but actually those topics are closely intertwined when it comes to uh, climate work. The energy working group that Dan is co-chairing, transportation, and uh, what's the last one there? Natural working lands that, that Maureen is on. Next slide. Okay, I'll turn it over to Hannah to pick up here with the discussion of the council's adaptation goals. Great, thank you, Jerry. So, I mean, just to be clear in climate language, I'm sure lots of folks on this call are, are very familiar, sort of the, the two big words are mitigation. So how do we mitigate or reduce the amount of carbon that we're emitting? And um, certainly the energy group, the transportation group and the buildings group are, are really focusing on how to reduce um, the amount of carbon emissions. They also have adaptation goals as well, but those are sort of the three focus areas. I'd say natural and working lands probably has, has both areas, like how do we sequester more carbon in our forests and our soils, um, but also how do we help adapt? And then certainly the coastal and marine group has, has is, as well as the resilience group are focused on, on adaptation. How do we help make sure that the impacts of climate that are here and that are um, likely predicted to come, that Maine is ready for them? Um, how do we prioritize the needs, especially of Maine's most vulnerable communities, um, to the challenges that, that climate brings, whether it's um, high heat days, uh, whether it's weatherization of homes that are, that are cold, whether it's impacts on industries, um, whether it's fishing or farming um, that will be felt, um, those are incredibly important. Um, we also uh, know and believe that um, Maine's uh, forest land, our agriculture communities, um, have opportunity with, with some of the challenges of climate. Um, and there's, you know, Maureen could probably answer this question um, best, but there are um, clearly um, uh, a lot of opportunities, especially in the forest product sector um, for the state of Maine when it comes um, to climate challenges, both whether it's using wood products for insulation and building materials, mass timber, um, to building forest land that can sequester more carbon. Um, just, uh, just this sort of helps to, to encourage, um, this council is really focused on diversity and inclusion and equity, and we are working now and throughout the summer to make sure that um, communities, whether they're fishermen or tribal communities, um, low-income communities, um, are, are engaged in this plan and, and have a voice, so that's important to our work. And again, all the, all the work of the Climate Council um, certainly is focused on use, utilizing um, science and technical information. I will say one of the challenges of both the science um, group as well as the natural and working lands is just coming up with um, a strategy and process by which we 
um, count for sequestration for our state. I mean, carbon neutrality, people kind of try to figure out what that is, and it really is how much um, carbon is the state sequestering versus how much are we emitting. So making sure that the science of that is really accurate and defensible um, and something that we all um, trust and believe is incredibly important. Uh, next slide. Um, so I, I won't talk a lot about this slide. Jerry did, did a good job explaining it. Um, the science and technical group um, is an incredibly important group. They have already actually issued um, a draft report, which is on our website, um, maine.gov slash future. You can find out lots of information about the Maine Climate Council there. Um, you can click on any of the different subcommittees, including the science and technical subcommittee. Um, they issued a report about the impacts um, climate has already had on the state of Maine. Um, and again, they are among our most important groups. Um, Maine is very blessed to have some of the most amazing climate scientists in the world, whether it's in the forest sector or the marine sector, um, Arctic, um, lots of Arctic um, uh, expertise at the University of Maine. So um, we are really relying on them to be the bedrock of all of our work. Uh, next slide. Um, so we talked a lot about the working groups. They are, they are sort of the, the, the people who are doing a lot of the heavy lifting right now. As Jerry mentioned, we have six of them. Um, there are 232 Mainers. They include legislators, uh, nonprofit, municipal, business representatives, uh, young people, um, all the diverse groups that we want to make sure are a part of this process. Um, so they sort of make up the beginning of stakeholder work, making sure a diverse group of people who don't necessarily all agree with what should be done are a part of our process of coming up with solutions um, to recommend for the Climate Action Plan. So those groups have been meeting, as Jerry said, since October. This June, um, they are reporting out their draft strategies. Um, they have been aided by um, uh, a group of uh, uh, consultants who are helping us do modeling work to really understand what will those recommendations yield us when it comes to carbon reduction. Um, so those are incredibly important and uh, among sort of the, the really, the brain power of the Climate Council. Uh, next slide. So as I talk about the brain power of the Climate Council, um, I'm gonna turn it over to, to Dan Burgess. He is, as he said, chairing the um, energy group and um, that group, obviously, a lot of this is about energy. And so um, just kind of understanding those issues um, is important to understanding the Climate Council's work. Thanks, Anna. Um, so I want to give you all a sense of what's being discussed at, at, at the working group level, and particularly in the energy working group. And I think to do that, I uh, want to give you a sense of uh, where our electricity is coming from. You know, Jerry mentioned that uh, by in that chart that the electricity sector only makes up a, under 10% of our emissions. But as we begin to electrify more of our, our, our heating through air source heat pumps and, uh, and, and other low carbon resources on the heating side, and then uh, uh, electrify our transportation sector, we're going to be relying more on electricity. So we need to make sure that we're um, ensuring that those come from lower carbon resources. This chart, I won't spend a lot of time on it, comes from our regional grid operator, and it shows uh, the 20 year makeup of where our electricity has come from uh, as a region. We share a grid with the other, other New England states. And so all the way over to the left, in the year 2000, uh, the notable trend here is that you can see that coal and oil uh, used to uh, make up somewhere between 35 and 40% of the electricity that our region uh, was um, consuming. Fast forward all the way uh, going to the right by 2019, coal and oil uh, make up 0.5% uh, of the electricity. So our, our grid has become um, significantly cleaner. There are many reasons for that. You'll see at the top uh, is a real uh, growth in natural gas, and that has helped from an, an emissions perspective, um, but has also made us much more reliant on, on natural gas for our electricity. So many reasons uh, for these changes, uh, economics, uh, Reggie, and, and others, but this is where our electricity is, is coming from as a region. Next slide. And so, as mentioned, Maine increased our renewable portfolio standard up from 40% to 80% by 2030. This is uh, in comparison to the state, other states in New England, 
You can see Maine as the, as the purple line used to be uh, at the bottom. These are for uh, um, new resources, and now we are, have, have one of the most ambitious in the country. Next slide. So as we think about how are we, uh, what, what renewable resources are we going to be using to, to meet, meet those, there are many that are eligible in our portfolio standard, wind, solar, biomass, geothermal, fuel cells. Uh, many of those are contributing. One, one area that we see a lot of potential in is for offshore wind. Uh, this is a, a wind speed map of the United States. You can see that uh, California and off the, off the Gulf of Maine have some of the best resources in the country. So we see a, a very significant opportunity for offshore wind, responsibly cited offshore wind and developed in a way that uh, minimizes uh, impacts on existing, existing users. But you know, we have joined a federal task force that uh, uh, leases areas off, off the Gulf of Maine and then we're excited about the Maine Aqua Venice uh, floating demonstration project that is uh, currently under development by the University of Maine. And I'll just show you on that chart on the right, you can see uh, this, and this is a few months old, it's a higher number now that we are uh, up and down the East Coast seeing um, an incredible uh, amount of growth in offshore wind projects with over 22 gigawatts of commitments. Um, that, that stems down from Virginia all the way up to, to our project in Maine. And so there, there are currently only 30 megawatts in the water, but there are uh, more than 22 gigawatts of, of uh, commitments up and down the East Coast. Next slide. And so as the Next slide, please. And so as the Energy Working Group, we have 30 members, as, as Hannah and Jerry discussed. This is not an echo chamber. This is uh, uh, 30 experts or representatives of, of industry, technology, uh, utilities, and others that are working to um, figure out how we most cost effectively and uh, effectively achieve these uh, 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 energy goals and emission reduction goals. And we're you know, looking at both mitigation and adaptation, as well as how um, low and moderate income and other vulnerable residents could be impacted by some of these, these changes. Um, we're also tasked with uh, working with the rest of the Commons Council to develop a clean energy economy transition plan so that as we continue to, to grow the amount of clean energy on the grid, as we make some of these changes, how do we make sure that the economy um, is, um, is supporting that and that we get a robust clean energy economy that, that comes with it? Next slide. So we have uh, had uh, six or seven different meetings and have begun splitting up into subgroups to look at um, initial recommendations, which we'll give to the Climate Council. And those have focused on um, supply. So uh, again, some of the electric supply that, uh, categories are issues that I talked about before, but also thermal supply. So where are we getting, where are we getting our, our, our heating and, um, and other thermal resources? How do we maximize that supply and optimize the grid um, so that you know, we're not just adding supply for the sake of adding supply, but we're adding it in the right places at the right times. And then how are we, how are we financing that? And what, what permitting issues might, might be available? Um, I would also indicate and add that we're looking at um, innovative technologies. There's been talk of um, things like energy storage, again, offshore wind, even things like uh, uh, renewable fuels and, and hydrogen that, um, you know, other parts of the world are beginning to look at. And we, this Climate Council and, and other members are bringing that uh, in some ways, kind of global expertise to, to make sure that Maine is on the on the cutting edge. And then underneath all of that, again, is the discussion and ensuring that we're we're thinking of uh, an equitable transition as we're, as we're going through this. So we'll be meeting um, a couple times for the remainder of the month. Would encourage anyone to join us. Uh, Beth Ahern uh, is is a part of that group, as are others on this call. And it's been a, it's been a great discussion. And you know, we're looking forward to um, continuing the process and and hope everyone uh, will continue to engage. So that is what's happening at the Energy Working Group. Great. Well, I'll just close it out, and uh, hopefully we have a few minutes for questions. But I would just say that um, this process, we've tried to include a lot of people in our in our meetings, in our, our working groups, and in our council. Um, but we know that this is an issue that many Mainers are passionate about. Um, luckily, a lot of them agree with us that this is a, an issue that we should address, but people have, have brought us um, over the course of the last year um, a ton of great ideas, um, areas of focus, um, specific suggestions. 
Um, so you can engage um, at our website now. At, you go to maine.gov slash future and find the Climate Council. Uh, we post all of our meetings, the meeting minutes. You can find ways to attend them virtually. Um, but I'd say most importantly, over the course of the summer, um, we're going to be launching a, a significant public engagement effort. Um, we had envisioned um, large public meetings this spring where we could invite you um, to hear about what we're doing and give your opinion on specific um, parts of the plan. Um, that's uh, now more challenging, so we're going to do it with a, um, a significant web effort as well as smaller group meetings. So um, sign up on our website to be a part of our, um, to make sure you get our emails and you can be noticed when this comes out. But clearly, um, we know that public opinion polls tell us the vast majority of Mainers are with us. They think climate is an issue that is urgent and needs to be addressed. Um, but having as many main people as possible sort of following the details of the plan, giving their input, telling us what they think is most important, also what they would be willing to do in their own lives to help um, with some of the challenges, um, that's what we plan to put out this summer. So you can tell us your opinion now um, or you can wait for over the summer. But again, uh, we really appreciate folks even uh, showing up to hear us on a beautiful Friday. So thank you. And the one last thing I'd add uh, before we get to the Q&A portion is um, building on what Hannah just said, if folks on this call have idea for ideas for potential ambassadors that we might be able to recruit to build support for the recommendations that are coming out of the council, people who are not connected with the Climate Council work or the administration, but maybe have compelling stories to tell about the effect that climate change is having on them or their business, um, we'd be very interested in hearing about that. So you could contact any of us or, or just submit comments through the Climate Council website that Hannah just mentioned. Great, thank, thank you. Barry. Thank you so much, um, Directors Burgess and Pingree and Commissioner Reed. We appreciate your time on this Friday. Um, and again, thank you so much for leading the governor's efforts on climate change. Um, we're really lucky to have you. Um, before we turn to questions, we just wanted to highlight a few action items, action steps you can take related to the Climate Council. They're listed here, and Abby's going to share a couple of links through the chat. Um, you can sign up for the Climate Council information list that Hannah mentioned. Um, also, if you go to our website, mainconservation.org, you can sign up to be on our list. We send regular updates. And then also Abby will share in the chat, uh, chat box um, a link to our petition calling for a strong and equitable climate action plan. Okay, so now it's time for questions and answers, question and answer. Um, and there are two on transportation. The first one is from Leah Lowry, and she has a question about the turnpike widening. If we're trying to reduce our transportation emissions, it looks like the state's getting ready to widen the turnpike. Um, can you speak to that? Jerry, you must be permitting that. <laughs> I can't say any of us are involved in the specific turnpike widening issues. So I know I can't give you a great yeah. answer on that. Yeah, I think DEP did issue a permit last year for uh, the York Toll Plaza project. I'm not aware of any other pending um, applications for turn turnpike widening, but you know, I take the point of the question to be um, whether enlarging infrastructure to carry more cars is really in the long-term interests of the state, given our, our goals to, reduc to reduce emissions from the transportation sector. And I think that's a point that we're all well aware of and the DOT is well aware of, and, and you can expect us to be engaged in some um, discussions about that. Also on transportation, seeing that chart where 54% of the emissions are coming from the transportation sector, there's a question from NRCM about the trans Transportation Climate Initiative and where the state stands on that and if that will be part of this process. I mean, I think I would say um, we are we are um, excitedly um, awaiting the recommendations of the Transportation Committee. I think obviously, um, as Jerry's slide was indicated, transportation is among our most significant challenges. So. I know that group has been working um, overtime and mid-June they will be presenting um, their strategies to us. I think 
clearly electrifying transportation and reducing the number of miles people travel, whether it's through a variety of different, whether it's telecommuting or ride sharing or public transportation, there are a lot of different options. Uh, the Transportation Climate Initiative is um, a multi-state effort um, that is sort of, uh, the state has been monitoring and, and um, following that closely to see what happens with it. Um, but, I, and I don't know necessarily, it's a funding strategy and a, and a carbon reduction strategy. I don't know where the Transportation Committee will come out. Um, but I'd say it's something that, that we've all been following closely. Dan, you want to? No, I, I think that's right. Monitoring, monitoring that and, and looking forward to seeing the Climate Council recommendations around both those issues. Great. So this next question comes from Dan Amory. Um, the state's revenues are projected to decline by 25 to 30% in fiscal year 2021 and are likely to remain challenged for years to come. Will the governor continue to prioritize the resources needed to implement the climate action plan in this constrained environment? Will the strategies coming out of the Climate Council process be dependent on state funding? I mean, I think, uh, hey, Dan, my, my neighbor on North Haven in the summertime, um, good to hear you virtually. Um, I think we're all trying to understand, you know, we are facing I would say now uncharted territory in terms of the number of dislocated Mainers, people um, who are losing their jobs, revenue losses for the state. Um, certainly, I would say even Congress is wrestling with this uh, this upcoming week on how to help states through these challenges. Um, we, we, I know J Jerry, Dan and I believe that um, we, we hope Congress will turn its attention to how do you help states rebuild um, through green recovery programs. It happened in the 2009 stimulus where um, states received significant funding for energy projects, infrastructure projects that help put people back to work and help build more sustainable long-term economies. Um, that is something I'll be lobbying my mother and others on um, in the coming days. Um, we may not have a federal administration is open to that, but um, we still remain hopeful. I would say the governor is, is, is committed to climate, and I think we'll all try to think creatively about how to make sure we can continue to make progress um, despite what is going to be um, significant fiscal um, challenges. I would say some of the areas that Dan is working in on energy offer a variety of ways to figure out creative funding solutions. Um, and also, we will all continue to emphasize that um, climate and putting people back to work can be um, simultaneous. You know, rebuilding the forest product sector, the energy economy, this, these are economic opportunities that, that could help build a more sustainable Maine. So. Great. And there's another question related to this from Andy Burt. Um, how will the Climate Council and your departments work with this new economic um, recovery task force that the governor just announced? Yeah. Um, good question. I mean, I would say our office is helping to staff it. So we're helping putting the pieces together. Um, there are uh, Vaughn Woodruff from InSource Renewables is on that group, a real believer in sustainable energy. And I'd say the, the whole group kind of understands the picture that, that we're talking about with green recovery. So um, I hope there's interaction. I think we're dealing with slightly different issues, but there are certainly areas of overlap, especially when it comes to how we help Maine rebuild um, in the energy sector. I don't know if Jerry or Dan have anything to add to that. Yeah, hi Andy. I, I would just add that it's so early that we're still kind of gonna be figuring that, figuring that out for a bit, but Hannah is very well positioned to make sure that we don't lose any opportunities that way. Great. Um, the next question is about public engagement in the process. How will people without broadband be able to participate or how will you engage people who don't have access to broadband in this process? I mean, I, I would say that in our summer public engagement, um, we have talked about both an online process that allows pe people to participate when they have time um, and specific efforts to reach out to people in small groups. So we will do proactive work to try to get out and talk to people who lack internet access, who, you know, just aren't, haven't, haven't stumbled upon our website and heard about this effort. I would say that we plan to have a toolkit online 
to, um, and, and we're gonna ask Mainers to help us in that process. So if you have groups, friends, neighbors, churches, um, you know, people in your community who you want to engage, we're gonna ask you as sort of ambassadors to help us find those people. Um, because I know Jerry, Dan and I can't do it all ourselves. <clears throat> I know that LCV I'm sure will help us do that as well. So um, it's, it's not, um, it still is, is a good question and a complicated question, but um, we're gonna rely on, on, on folks to help us do that work because it is important. Great, thank you. Maybe under the wire, one more question. Um, it's a friendly question. <laughs> it's um, from Sean Mahoney. Um, what are the like specific actions that you would like this group to take? Are there people on the fence that need a push or is there something, some way that this group can be helpful to the council's efforts? And then we'll wrap up. Well, Dan and Jerry, yeah, I mean, I've been doing I, all the talking, you go for it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Hey, Sean, uh, thanks for the softball. Um, I would say so many of you in the audience today are already helping us in a variety of very specific ways and have been really generous with your time through working groups or, or in, other, in other ways. Um, the, the one thing that I mentioned earlier is this idea of if you can give some thought to, idea, to, to identifying people who really haven't been part of the process yet, don't have any connection to the administration, but would be really great ambassadors for the cause. Um, I, I think there's probably some more potential to do work that way. And those are the voices that are so influential, as we all know, with, with policymakers, is people who aren't getting paid to, to appear before the committee to deliver a, a canned message, but people who are speaking in very plain terms from the heart about their own experiences and why this matters to them. So if we can all work together to think about more examples of that to, to bring into the conversation, I think would be really helpful. And I would just add uh, that, you know, uh, as you look at uh, examples in your, in, in your own life or in your local community, I think those are incredibly powerful and would encourage everyone to, you know, visit Efficiency Main Trust to learn about different sustainability or energy programs happening that they can be, they can participate in and can, um, you know, would encourage everyone to, to look that way as well. Great. And I would, I would just add, Sean, you're among our, our, our friends and champions, as are I'm sure many on this call, but I think in the coming months, um, thinking about a green recovery and, and the economic challenges our state faces and how we can all advocate for, um, for programs that both support climate goals and put people back to work, I think those, are, those can be really um, linked. And I think we, we uh, whether it's individual citizens or um, activists can help make that happen and, and certainly encourage uh, Congress to think about that as well. I just want to say we had a ton of really excellent questions that we didn't get to, um, so we might have to bring you back um, another time. But for now, thank you so much to uh, Directors Tingri and Burgess and Commissioner Reed. We really appreciate it. See clapping. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Clapping emoji. Yeah, and so just for everyone, we will um, be emailing you a brief survey. We really value your feedback. If you could take a few minutes to fill that out, fill that out um, we would appreciate it. And if you've enjoyed this Lunch and Learn, uh, please join us for next Friday's, which will be on carbon pricing with Robert Stoddard from the Berkeley Research Group. Um, so thank you again. Um, and thanks again to our speakers. Have a really great weekend, everyone. Thanks, thanks everyone. everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you.